Hello, everyone. I'm Marisa Monreal. I'm a chemist working in the CIIAC group listed up there in the chemistry division at Los Alamos National Laboratory. And it's my job today to give you a brief overview uh, in the next few minutes of the molten salt research that's going on at Los Alamos. At Los Alamos, we're focusing on actinide molten salts. Um, so in particular, what I mean when I say actinide, we're looking at uranium, thorium, and plutonium containing salt systems. Um, you notice I have halides there, uh, and that's kind of purposeful. So there's a lot of questions, a lot going on about chloride or fluoride. So mostly we've been focusing on chloride salts, and that has to do with the fact that we are a weapons lab. And so we have lots of experience pyroprocessing plutonium uh, for weapons metal and so for weapons production. And so that happens in chloride salt. So we're basically leveraging a long history of experience working with actinides or specifically plutonium at all kinds of oxidation states in molten chloride. However, because we've been developing this molten salt reactor based capability somewhat over the last, I'd say five-ish years, five, six years, uh, we've realized and been approached by uh, lots of developers that are interested in fluoride salts as well. Um, and so through those efforts, we've been starting to develop more in the fluoride salt range uh, or fluoride salts. Um, and so that's a little bit more of a nascent effort, but we're getting there. And of late, we are developing a beryllium containing system um, effort. Uh, and so that's through some work with Kairos Power. Uh, and so that's adding yet another hazard to the mix, but uh, we're doing it. And so we're just in stage now of developing that research space. So I've just kind of listed the research activities there. Um, on the left, I would say the first two um, really focus in on preparing, synthesizing, and then confirming the purity of the components of these systems of focus. So both the solvent salts and also the actinide halides. Uh, then that third bullet uh, is really kind of the bulk of our work. Um, so we you know, take those pure components, make our mixtures, and then study the chemistry and the thermochemical and thermophysical properties of those systems. Uh, kind of as a natural um, follow-on to that um, is evaluating materials of construction in these extreme environments, right? They're radioactive, corrosive, high temperature. Uh, and so when you're developing new, you know, maybe even taking known techniques to look at these uh, systems, you need to develop the sample holder that can contain them appropriately. Um, and so evaluating the materials of construction for sample holders, but also this naturally means things like corrosion. So being able to measure corrosion rates um, um, so we can understand what types of materials can hold these systems and how they last over time. And then kind of the last two bullets there have um, evolved a little bit more recently as we've been kind of collecting these um, fundamental properties data. Um, we've been working with our colleagues in the engineering departments, uh, engineering groups, um, both on site and with other national labs to uh, develop in situ diagnostic equipment. And then really recently um, working more with the nonproliferation community and global security um, because we can use these um, capabilities as a test bed uh, for identifying signatures and diversionary tactics um, uh, for, the, uh, for, this, for this area. So kind of going to the bottom right of this slide here, obviously the um, nuclear energy and nuclear security fields are impacted, but kind of in a, a nice uh, follow-on to all of this, we're making contributions to fund fundamental actinide science. Um, and then, as I mentioned, the, the non-pro and global security worlds. Okay, so I want to describe our uh, LDRD research project that really kind of helped us uh, build this capability uh, to, its, to its current day. Um, and so this is a project you can see at the top left, I've listed the years FY21 through 23 with an asterisk. So this project was intended to end this past September. Luckily, you can see at the bottom there, we've got an extension um, until May to continue some kind of narrowed down focus work um, using our lance capability. I'm gonna describe, describe a little bit about that in just a moment. Um, so it's a little bit um, ongoing uh, into this next spring. Our main objectives of this LDRD project are listed up at the top, but really ultimately we're trying to develop new techniques, advanced techniques in both experiment and modeling uh, to be able to get our ultimate goal of a predictive capability with quantified uncertainty for these properties. I've got the technical goals listed at the bottom left there, but really um, it just kind of boils down to AIMD and physics-based models to get to that predictive capability validated with experimental 
data gathering, included there in the second uh, in the chemistry thrust, of course, making the peer systems. So here's kind of a summary table of our experimental capabilities at Los Alamos. Um, I wanna say I am focusing mostly on the experimental capabilities in this talk, um, but I can connect you with the folks that are doing the modeling and simulation at Los Alamos. Um, so we can talk further, you can talk further about that. Uh, so at the top of this table is really the macro scale properties, the thermophysical properties, and then um, you can see the techniques we're using and developing for each property. Um, so just to quickly run down, um, I'd say, the neutron radiography for density is probably our most mature technology, but um, we are also developing higher throughput methods for the neutron radiography work. And so conventional pushrod dilatometry is what we're developing for that. Same thing can be said for viscosity. We have a neutron radiography technique, but also rotational viscometry is being developed as well. Uh, we use DSC for melt point um, and also heat capacity, but we also are developing drop calorimetry for heat capacity as well electrochemical techniques to measure corrosion, uh, but also to look at things like local structure as you work down the table there um, to understand and help us um, with the coordination environment, redox chemistry, things like that. At the bottom, like I said, local structure, um, not just electrochemistry, but we're also looking at things like PDF analysis and Raman spectroscopy. And then the foundation of all of it is the synthesis and characterization of the components. So just a detail now to start talking about the work we did this past fiscal for uh, MSR campaign. Uh, I'll give a little bit of background. About three-ish years ago, we started developing this technique to use neutron radiography to measure density. This is just a picture of the flight path at uh, the Los Alamos Neutron Science Center where we carry out this work. You can see the furnace right there in the middle of the neutrons come through. Why neutrons? We've got to penetrate all the furnace and everything that's, that we can actually probe the, the systems of interest. Um, and the, the detector assembly there on the right. Uh, just showing a picture in the center there, kind of a more detailed picture of what the samples are held in, the conflat in the center there. Uh, basically, the idea is just to put a, a known amount, a known mass of your um, systems of interest loaded into those two tubes, one on either side. There's a reference uh, kind of piece in the center there. We need that because we need to stitch together all of the images um, that we take of the system when it's molten. And so with a, so basically we're mapping, we're measuring the uh, volume by watching the meniscus uh, as it goes over temperature. And so with the volume and the known mass, we can derive our density. So this is just summarizing some of the uh, work that we've published um, on uranium uh, bearing salt systems. Uh, we have a couple of papers, one on the density, one that contains the density data, um, as well as our work in confirming the purity of those um, systems. And then there's a technique paper that describes the whole technique. But for the past fiscal year, um, fiscal year 23, um, we worked uh, under the MSR campaign to extend this to plutonium systems. Uh, so first off, I have to say, um, Thank you to Patricia for your leadership and understanding with all of this very difficult work and uh, logistics to execute um, because the idea here was to receive um, material that was synthesized at INL by Tony Carlson and her team so that both INL and Los Alamos were measuring the exact same plutonium uh, sodium chloride system. Uh, or salt uh, with two different techniques. So Tony Carlson and her team used the Archimedes method and at Los Alamos, we used our neutron radiography technique. Pretty picture of the salt up at the top left. Uh, so first things first, we need to make sure we can, uh, that the sample uh, survived the shipment from INL. And so we do that with uh, just DSE. Um, it's a little bit challenging to have plutonium um, measurements. Um, uh, so there's lots of techniques to confirm purity, uh, but uh, having been able to have that capability for a plutonium is a little bit harder. Uh, so DSE is kind of our, our go-to in this regard. Um, and the data did match up. So thankfully, after all of our hard effort, uh, the material had survived the shipment. We also had to do some uh, quite a bit of development on the containment um, of, of our samples. Um, so 
This looks very different than the uh, sample holders that I just showed you for uranium. Uh, you can see each one has its own thermocouple and we did a lot of development um, all thanks to Travis Carver who worked on developing the furnace so that we could get a lot of the thermocouples and heating, heating elements out of the way um, of the neutron beam and really get a better picture um, of our samples. And then I have a little picture there on the left I like to show because these, sim these samples need to go from our plutonium facility uh, over to uh, over DOT roads over to to Lance, uh, which requires a shipment that happens at 4 a.m. So that's what I'm showing on the left there. Uh, hopefully I can get this to work. Oh, good. Um, so this is uh, what, what you get when you have neutrons uh, so as your eyes on sample. Um, you can stitch together your images and make videos. Um, and so that's kind of what's looping there in the middle is uh, we captured uh, what I'd like to think of as a melt point experiment that we all did probably in chemistry or physics first year in the capillary uh, that you were staring at for a while, but now we're using neutrons <laughs> to watch it in a steel wage lock tube. Um, but so here's some of the experimental details on the left. Um, you can see we did this right before Christmas uh, last year, last calendar year. Um, and uh, just a few of our, of our other uh, experimental details are listed there. We went up to about almost a thousand C um, and just talks about our different measurements that we took. Um, also on the far right, I like to point out the difference between the resolution on that image and the one I showed you for uranium. We made a lot of improvements too on just the camera, being able to get better pictures um, over the past year. Here's some of the preliminary results on that work. And this is just showing the eutectic um, and with a very generous, um, in our opinion, 2% error bar, um, we are working to get a better, more precise error analysis on that data. And then also calculate um, all the mixtures that we did, calculate these plots for the other mixtures as well. Um, in addition to this data, we are also awaiting the start of the next beam cycle, which actually I just heard this is about to happen in the next couple of weeks or so. Um, uh, so because we need to do some repeats, we want to do some uh, redo some of these samples, and then we're also doing a few other mixtures as well. Um, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. I won't read through this entire slide here, but there's a couple of features about the neutron radiography that I want to bring up and address a point that gets brought up a lot when I when I talk about this. Uh, so I, in my opinion, the best part about this is that you have eyes on the sample the whole time. Um, this is hard to do when you have a sample that's had molten and inside of a furnace. And so I think there's a lot of benefit to being able to see things like inhomogeneities, um, bubbles that definitely form, uh, and so on. So um, that's something that we are you know, we point to as a great benefit. Um, but the downside is, is maybe um, kind of at the bottom of the list, and that is that it's very resource laden. So you know we're stuck to the schedule of Lance, which gets delays every year. Um, you know there's lots of other people that want to use Lance. It's a user facility, um, and so on. And so we do need to you know, use it for what it's great at on getting good measurements, having your eyes on your sample, but use it to benchmark in addition to having higher throughput methods like I mentioned earlier. Um, and for higher throughput, not just not using lamps, but also using less material um, is, is another big feature. So our rotational viscometry or pressure dilatometry uses you know, milligrams of samples or a gram at the most, whereas um, the samples at Lance are taking more on the tens of grams scale. So just a quick list of what we have coming up um, starting hopefully in a couple of weeks. We'll be looking at local structure um, using pair distribution function. Uh, we'll be doing those other compositions I was talking about for density. We've done some improvements on our falling sphere um, apparatus for measuring viscosity. Um, in addition to some nice uh, work with our collaborators at Oregon State University for the rotational viscometry. Turns out we're also making spheres in-house now. <laughs> so the spheres for, um, for the falling sphere uh, experiment need to be of such contrast to so that the neutrons can see them as they flow through the actinide and molten salt, which is challenging. So um, we like to, we're making alloys that are boron and, and with various boron content. Um, and that turns out it can be done in a furnace in a glove box, which we have lots of. So we're doing that as well. Uh, just to highlight a couple of the newer capabilities, and I promise I'm almost done. Um, so uh, I was talking about making um, pure 
halides, and we just had a question about uh, making uh, fluoride, uranium fluoride. Uh, so this is an area um, that we, as a chemist, I have to say this, I, and this is one of my favorite parts about what we do. So of course we use lots of conventional methods to make what we what we need, uh, but we also um, are interested in novel synthetic techniques. So I've listed just a couple of them there, um, taking soluble um, your, uh, actinide halide compounds that we know how to make that are published in the literature, some of them that we published ourselves, and then trying different techniques to get the non-ligated or non-solvated um, uh, actinide halides is an area of work that we are that we are currently working on. Um, I want to point out the work of Nicholas Capra and Carla Erickson on that bottom line there. That's work that just happened a couple of weeks ago. The isolation of UF4 in a pure uh, form it was a very small scale, but he's working to scale it up. Um, and so, and then the, on the top there, there's a, another paper that's going to be published soon on the generation of UCL3. On the right, I'm just kind of highlighting all those techniques I was talking about to confirm purity. Our kind of go-to is using DSC melt point um, and PXRD, but we're also developing solid state NMR capabilities, um, specifically to look at kind of the speciation. So being able to see what other uranium or other actinide species are present um, and quantify that. Uh, as an area of interest. And then we have some high temperature Raman work that just got accepted for publication in inorganic chemistry uh, that'll be coming out uh, hopefully soon. Um, and then the second and final uh, recent capability uh, and the developments I wanted to talk about um, is our molten salt electrochemistry. Um, we have prepared um, a, re a robust reference electrode for work in molten salts, published that in a couple of years ago. It's on the top left. We have some work going on in small area working electrodes to be able to get nice resolution on our cyclical tamograms. That's on the top right. And then really recently, um, we've been looking into boron dope diamond for F-block electroanalytical chemistry in both chloride and fluoride salts. Um, and I wanted to draw your attention to a poster that's going to be shown uh, later at the poster session. That's Hannah Pattenot, who's a graduate student from UNLV, who's working at Los Alamos now, and she'll be talking about some of that work. I know this is a long list. I definitely didn't mean for you to <laughs> to try to write it down or even read it, but I just wanted to reassure you, uh, Joanna, let me know these slides will be available uh, after the conference. And so um, I just wanted to point out, I have basically given an annotation, an annotated bibliography of what I've talked about today. The top eight are our pubs in all of the areas and I've described them in green. And then the bottom three um, are either submitted or should be submitted very so shortly for the EMF and the synthesis papers. Uh, so keep a lookout for those. And uh, hopefully you can see the slide after the conference. And then I wanted to wrap up by giving a, a kind of an advertisement for something that happened earlier this year, which is that we got some funding to build a uh, new plutonium R&D lab at Los Alamos, which might sound weird because I just got done telling you that we have a long history of working with plutonium. Why do we need this? Uh, and that's really because at, the, at Los Alamos, we work in the... Um, and the plutonium facility, which is for has it's mission driven, so it's very prescribed work. There's not a lot of room for uh, R and D, uh, and so uh, we were lucky that we have um, landed uh, some funding from the Non-Proliferation Stewardship Program to build this small scale, so gram scale plutonium R and D lab. It's going to have the three capabilities, kind of generally speaking, that we have shown there: um, so molecular chemistry and material science, uh, aqueous chemistry, and then uh, had to get in the molten salt science capability as well. Um, so there, I'm hopefully, knock wood, I'm not jinxing it. They've been making much faster progress on our renovation and construction than I expected. Um, and so it seems like probably around FY25-ish, we will actually be able to bring plutonium in and start our first work. Um, I have two open positions um, for working in this facility. I've listed them there. Again, it'll be available after the conference. Those are open positions to basically help us develop and work in uh, this plutonium science laboratory or the plus lab. We'll wrap up with acknowledgements, our team listed there. Uh, thank you very much. I'm grateful to the LDRD program, to the MSR uh, campaign, and then for our gain voucher with um, TerraPower um, that uh, we worked on some of this plutonium work I showed you today. Uh, I think, think there's our MSR team, or including INL that um, we, we worked with to do the density work I explained earlier. And then thank you very much to all of the university collaborators and especially the students that have been um, coming and visiting and working with us at Los Alamos. It's been great. Um, and so there's my blurb about Lance. Thank you very much.